Hi, everyone. Welcome to Literacy Quebec's 2021 Family Literacy Event. My name is Margot Legault, and I'm the Executive Director of Literacy Quebec. As tomorrow's Family Literacy Day in Canada, we know that many of you are busy organizing family literacy events, so we appreciate that you're able to join us today. Before we get started with the actual presentation, I just want to go over a few housekeeping items. So first of all, we have Chris and Gabby um, on tech support. So if anyone is having issues, you can always leave um, a comment in the chat and they'll be able to answer you, leave them a way of reaching you. Um, they're also going to put a phone number and an email address in the chat for you in case, um, you know, you're having issues with your sound or um, seeing things on the screen. You can always also reply to the email that we sent you the link on. So this is a Zoom webinar. So participants are muted and your cameras are off. Depending on the uh, device that you're using, and also if you're logged in through an app or the web browser, you might only see the slides on the screen and hear a voice, or you're going to see the slides as well as um, someone you know, speaking or presenting. For those of you who have colleagues who aren't able to attend today, be assured that this um, session is going to be recorded and available at a later date. And we'll also be sending you a lot of um, documentation and links that Dr. Denny has provided and wants to share with you after the event. The event itself is going to consist of an insightful look at the positive impacts of family literacy initiatives in diverse contexts, and then it will be followed by a question and answer period. You're welcome to add questions in the Q&A section throughout the event. Most probably it's going to be at the bottom of your screen um, on the right hand side. So now that we have all of that out of the way, I'm just going to give you a bit of information about Literacy Quebec. So Literacy Quebec is a network that connects and represents community-based literacy organizations to empower people, impact lives, and build a stronger society. We have been raising awareness and advocating for literacy service for English-speaking communities of Quebec for over 40 years. One of our most recent initiatives has been the launch of the Literacy Helpline, which was set up in response to the additional pressures faced by those struggling with literacy and digital literacy skills due to the current pandemic. So today's topic is very fitting and we're extremely pleased to have Dr. Tenny, Denny Taylor with us today. She's joining us from her home in New York. Dr. Taylor not only coined the term family literacy in her doctoral research, but she has been nominated for several research awards in recognition of her lifetime commitment to transdisciplinary family literacy scholarship and fieldwork with families living in urban and rural poverty in the US and in regions of armed conflict and catastrophic events around the world. In 2013, she founded Garn Press, uh, for which we'll send you more information but um, through the press, she mentors writers of conscience and pub publishes books by teachers and scientists that address some of the most urgent global issues of our times. Dr. Taylor initiated a family literacy global peace project through which she is advocating for international cooperation in family literacy initiatives and projects that focus on peace building and responding to climate urgency. I could go on and on. Um, Dr. Denny Taylor's CV is available on her website and it's over 40 pages. So very accomplished. And we talk when we talk about lifetime commitment, it really is a lifetime commitment to family literacy. So um, I know you're just as anxious as I am to hear Dr. Denny Taylor speak. So without further ado, it's um, true honor to present Dr. Denny Taylor. Are we ready? Yes. I, I'm so glad to be able to be with you this, this morning. Uh, we started getting ready yesterday and I just want to thank Marco and Laura and Chris and Gabby, who I haven't met, but uh, she's here this morning and I'm just grateful to all of them. And it was a bit like finding a family actually. So we had a really wonderful time putting this together yesterday. And uh, so my hat's off to them for the work that they're doing and, and to you for uh, the work that you're doing. Uh, 
I'm, I'm sure you, you might know or you might not that Canada has been um, a global leader in family literacy uh, in the field. And I've, um, I've known of the work of many family literacy uh, researchers and practitioners in Canada going back to uh, the beginning of the 80s. And uh, Canada has really had an influence on what's happened with family literacy around the world. So hats off to, to all of you. Um, I'm going to focus a little bit um, this morning on some slides I put together for the UN that focus on family literacy and also on uh, family literacy around, around the world. And I was asked to do it, uh, the, I was invited to do this at the UN before COVID. And so we were getting ready and then we ended up um, having to cancel and it ended up with a, with a um, webinar that took place in May of last year. And I've taken those, those slides because we took about three months to put them together and I'm gonna present them this morning. And I'm hoping what they'll do is um, that you will um, find them as a stimulus to questions. And so, uh, we're hoping there'll be lots of questions. I'll go pretty quickly through the slides, share some of the main ideas about family literacy, and then really um, I'm looking forward to your questions and um, a conversation um, with Margot um, and, uh, as well, and Laura and Chris, if they can participate, and we'll address the questions that you might have. The other thing I wanted to say before I start is that I've also um, sent uh, some uh, documents to uh, Margot that uh, have very practical ideas in them. So it's almost like um, going for a meal. And so the slides and, and then the conversation afterwards. But I'm hoping that um, you'll find all of the extra ideas that you can take home with you. Um, and to, your, to the various programs that they will be really useful. Um, everything is in the commons and um, all the papers on my website are on the common, in the commons as well. So uh, we can start the first slide and I will try not to uh, spend too much time on each, each one so we have lots of time for questions. So, so the, the issue that came up was, so how do I, I was looking at family literacy and then they said, but you need to look at it in relationship to COVID. And so, so here it is, this is the presentation that, that focuses on the tremendous uh, challenges to families as, the, as uh, COVID has become a, a worldwide uh, pandemic. It is the, the biggest public health uh, crisis since uh, 1918. We can go to the next slide. Uh, all right. The thing that is so, uh, I think, is for all of us is that is to know that we are united. Um, the entire world is focused on trying to um, protect families from COVID and also to um, find ways to, uh, to actually eliminate uh, the virus. So, so COVID has actually united families around the, the, the world. And we're all talking about how um, children can go to school and um, how we work with them if they have to stay home. We can move to the next one. Okay, so so in every country, this is really just hats off to the to the healthcare workers and thinking about about their families. Uh, it's a huge issue um, for all of us that, that those that care for us, often who are not uh, very uh, paid very well, are not very very do not have um, a large many resources, uh, are now. Uh, working with their children. I know children are in school in Canada. Uh, in the States, they're not. In, in the UK, they're not. Uh, but, the, but the whole task of trying to, to work, take care of family is huge. 
we can move. Okay. So the remarkable fact is that there are already family literacy in initiatives in local, regional, global contexts that focus on public health emergencies that impact the health and well-being, um, and even the survival of fun vulnerable uh, families. The, the, the work that I've been doing at the UN has really taught me that while we think of family literacy as a way to help um, families with young children who are learning to read or with, with families where there are adults that um, are challenged by literacy. In actual fact, liter family literacy has become a conduit for, for all kinds of projects locally defined uh, and many of them are focusing on public health emergencies. Uh, South Africa has uh, family literacy programs that, that focus on HIV and uh, helping families who, who are dealing with, um, especially with, with HIV, but other health um, issues as well. And that's so, uh, there are, there are health-based family literacy programs around, around the world. And I, it's something that we don't think of. We think of it, family literacy, as a way to teach reading in family settings. And that's, that's actually uh, a very small part of what happens in family literacy programs. We can move on. And we can, aren't they lovely? <laughs> we can move on again. Okay, so there are three evidence-based aspects of family literacy initiatives that support governments using family as an organizing principle to respond to COVID-19, as well as create more inclusive societies. So we can move to the first of these three slides. So the first is that family literacy has become a vital and successful way of promoting literacy in families and uh, in communities and improves life circumstances, increases literacy levels in many UN member states. We actually did a whole pile of research to find out um, how many countries have family literacy programs. And we, so we've got as far as 140 UN member states have family literacy programs that, that uh, are designed to improve the life circumstances of, of uh, families. Number two. Okay. So, the, and this to me was really surprising is, is that family literacy is used to frame peace enhancing initiatives in UN member states. So where there's been conflict, there are often family literacy programs for children who've experienced trauma uh, for mothers who um, are um, often not able to go uh, out and have not been educated. And um, also for um, soldiers returning who have PTSD. Number three. So, so this is, to me is, is really important is that that, that family literacy is integral to, um, to uh, the sustainable development goals. I've spent a lot of time looking at families and climate change. And there are many programs that have been developed around the world that focus, uh, use family literacy as a way to meet the UN uh, sustainable development goals and to help families deal with um, the changes that are taking place in their local communities because of climate change. Okay, I shall just say okay and we can move on. Is that, that might work, Laura. Uh, family literacy is the primary organizing principle of all UN member states. I think that, that we can move on. The thing that um, is so important here is that family literacy um, is supported by the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. If we go to the next slide. OK. 
here it is. Here's Eleanor Roosevelt. There's a statue of her outside my apartment. I love to go out and look at her sitting. She's at standing actually uh, out there looking exactly as she does in that picture. So the recognition of the inherent dignity and of the equal and inalienable rights of all members of the human family is the foundation of freedom, justice, and peace in the world. And uh, we ignore that at our peril. Okay, next slide. So here's, to me, this is the most important point in advocacy for family literacy, is that it is important that, that decision makers are aware that the family is the one common element of every human society, and that family is the primary and most essential organizing principle in every UN member state. And so to those who hold power, you know, that this webinar, this is when I was doing this for the UN, is a, a reminder of the importance um, of, uh, that children and their families belong at the heart of all decision-making about the, the uh, future of human societies. Okay. And this is showing the global pandemics, political upheaval, violent conflicts, biodiversity loss. These are all problems for families. We can move on. Okay, so focusing on the well being and health of children and their families provides a new way to measure. A country's progress. Think about what would happen if at the begin, middle of every decision making um, that is made by, by governments, the well-being of families was the uh, primary um, concern. We can move on. How are we doing for time? Can someone tell me? <laughs> okay. So, so, We're doing good, Denny. We are, okay, give me, a, let me know if I'm going too slowly and I will, I don't know if I can speed up, we could skip some. But, the, but the, 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 the piece of this that is really important is that the family is the primary organizing principle of all human uh, societies mm -hmm. and language and literacy is um, the ways in which all um, activity in families takes place. So it's, these are universals throughout all societies and we need to be aware of them. So our knowledge of language provides useful ways of thinking about the impact of, of the pandemic on families in communities in both local and global contexts. So we can move on. So this, this to me, when I first realized this was really, um, kind of astounding that this virus has actually provided uh, a global reading lesson. So symbols and words have come, become universal, creating collective understandings of the impact of the virus on families. It doesn't matter if we're in Wuhan or in New York or in Quebec. We understand what these pictures are. We understand this beautiful watercolor is actually of a deadly virus and that someone has taken the time to make um, this um, construction of, of the virus. And we can recognize it wherever we live in the world. We can move on. So, and then the one, the one on the, the right is, is a pinata, but these are just showing you the, the ways in which the virus is portrayed and and that, that we can read um, the, those symbols wherever we are on the planet. Off we go. So we all know the meaning of the images of washing hands, mask wearing, and those pictorial images, we can, we can read them, we know we, we know the images that warn us not to shed and spread, and we know um, everything that we do can flatten the curves. So all of these um, are, um, are images that are important to us. 
I just love the one. I love both of these actually. The Melita, the Melita coffee filter is there as a as a mask, and Melita started making masks. I think in Germany. We can move on. And there we're stopping the spread. These are images from the United Nations. We can just go through them quickly. Okay, we can move on. And and being human, we have to make fun of it in some way. And so showing dogs with, with masks on. And, and I didn't know what these things are. They're pool noodles that people are wearing on their heads to show that, so make sure they don't get too close to each other. It's actually in Germany. And now Germany is at the point where everyone has to have an I-95, a 95 uh, mask. We can move on. We can move on. I love that photo. So, so we come to family literacy and the idea that family literacy ties, fosters ties uh, between, between nations. And I, I mentioned this before that uh, family literacy is in at least 140 UN member states. We can move on. And those are the states. We don't need to stay here. <laughs> I love this project. This is this is um, the project in in family literacy project in South Africa, and uh, the the children are all holding up dolls that have been made for them by mothers in a family literacy project. And so the whole idea is is uh, children need empathy. They need they need to feel that they have belonging. So family literacy. Um, is building on ancient traditions that are pro have a proven global record uh, of uh, projects and initiatives that can result in rapid transformative change. Uh, and so, and so it's, it's a way of verifying that the work that you're all doing is absolutely um, vital uh, to families and to the ways in which we're coping with, with COVID, but also with the idea that children, we, you're, you're supporting families as they move into a post-COVID world. These are the, the mothers who are making the dolls in a family literacy um, project. These boys, um, they have their, their dolls and they take them everywhere with them to school. Uh, and they are reliable and present companions. I mean, such, a, such an important concept when children are stressed that um, they have things in their life that, that are constant, people as well as dolls. And here are the facilitators of that, of that project. We can move on. And here they are with books that they have made so, so while they're making the dolls and, and uh, creating opportunities for, for the children to feel safe, to experience joy, they're also making books and those books are in uh, their home languages. And in this project, they, they have produced 75 new Zulu titles uh, for uh, young readers. This vital work. And it's going, I know it's going on in, in, in Canada. I've met many people involved. Okay, we can move on again. I love this picture. And some of them have got their dolls. Okay, so learning. Um, Okay, so I missed that, that, that slide, but that's okay. Our focus now is on establishing policies and practices to ameliorate the suffering of families. I think that there's not enough, enough obviously, learning from families who have experienced catastrophic events. One of the things I've done uh, for um, decades is to work with families who, in the aftermath of either armed conflict or, or actually during armed conflict, and also uh, events like Katrina. And so um, family literacy has this huge role to play in, in this COVID world. Um, and 
uh, so these slides focus a little bit on that. We can move on. These children are in Gaza. I, I took this photograph. The goal is to use family literacy frameworks for sustaining peace and to respond to COVID. Um, and um, whoops, and these, these children are dealing with uh, some pretty difficult situations in, the, in, in Gaza. We can move on. So family literacy projects that focus on peaceful relocation. This is something that, that Canada has been a leader in, in using family literacy uh, it, with the relocation of refugees and economic migrants. There's tremendous amount written about the role that Canada has played. And it's one of the ways that Canada has been a world leader. We can move on. One of the things that has happened that we're probably not always aware of is that many migrants who were working in cities um, have literally been told to go home. And so there have been massive movements of people um, as uh, they, they are no longer able to work um, in the vicinities where they, they, uh, they had uh, moved to. And this is, uh, uh, being leaving Mumbai, Afghanistan, there's was there's been a tremendous amount of um, of concern. We can move on because so many street children um, in Afghanistan. There is no there. Everything is closed up, so um, children are really um, suffering because uh, of the lockdown. And I, it's certainly in the states. There's very little. Um, in fact, I would say no coverage of, of what's happening to children around the world. Um, but uh, the numbers um, are extraordinary and um, it's something we should all be aware of. We can move on. The thing, one of the, the points I would really like to um, emphasize is that um, teachers, family literacy, uh, uh, professionals, caregivers are not therapists and yet um, we work with children who have been traumatized and so um, there are things that we can do but we are not, th um, we're not therapists and it's something that I try to emphasize because taking a child into a traumatic event, um, asking them what happened to them can actually re-traumatize. And so, so teachers, we, we really ought to have much more, more training. Um, it is a role for social workers. And this is from, I was, uh, I spent a lot of time following Hurricane Katrina. I was there right after the, the um, hurricane. And this is work that was going on in a school in uh, New Orleans um, where children were working with the social worker. And this child is saying, I feel sad. I saw people dead in the water. And so it's a, it's a graphic reminder that um, the memories of traumatic events can stay with us um, through our lifetime. So this is Eric Kandel talking about crystal map and his memories of that time. We can move on. And again, social worker working with a child, describing how he feels, wobbly legs, heart pounding, um, and he drew a rodent by his foot. We can work, move on. So the two important points that I would like to you to to share with you is that the most important thing we can do when children are in stressful situations which they are globally at the moment is um, to focus on restoring the social fabric of children's lives and that's what family literacy programs do they are social um, events 
when families come together with a, a family literacy specialist. And so the whole idea of supporting the social fabric of children's lives is incredibly important. And you can think about the work that was doing in, going on in South Africa as they're making dolls, which don't seem like family literacy stuff, but they're absolutely essential to the children's health and well-being. And here, the, the whole idea that, that uh, families need joyful experiences uh, if they're going to have the best chance to recover from trauma. And we're all in that boat at this point in time. So those are the two. And here's, here's one of my, my uh, master's classes. There are doctoral students here too. When I, I taught this course called Family Literacy, um, and then the, and then this whole idea of using family literacy to create webs of caring. And so my students brought their children and we always um, got and get, get engaged in uh, projects uh, as these children are here. And we had family literacy nights and uh, just the joyfulness of bringing everyone together around making things, having projects, reading stories. Is, uh, and all of my students had to actually organize a family literacy night in their school. And so this is from another course, um, again, uh, looking at language and uh, the importance of children having experiences that will, in, will um, support them and encourage them to become resilient and confident and secure. secure and that's what we're about at this point. We need our children to feel resilient, confident and secure in a post COVID world, hoping that we get there soon, we can move on. You do need to give me a time thing. If, if, uh, I'm presuming we're okay, because no one has stopped me. <laughs> this is my great, great niece, kind of. She's actually the great granddaughter of one of my cousins. And she's writing about having to stay home. And uh, she also has, we have suffragettes in our, our family. So we can move on. This is Ava and I, I don't know if we are able to um, talk about, there's a video there, but we probably won't stop for it at the moment where she is part of her family uh, are focusing on uh, plastic and removing plastic. And so there is a video and perhaps at some point you'll be able to watch it where she's talking about um, adults um, becoming more responsible. We can move on, we're at the end. Okay, COVID-19 not only creates conditions for global reading lesson, the virus also creates the conditions for great transformations in all human societies. If we can grasp this piece of it that is around family, uh, we should be hopeful. Okay, one more, I think. Yeah. We've learned that families can share experiences on a planetary scale and together we can create a common language that is understood wherever we live, our task Right, our task now is to take this universally shared experience and use it for the common good and uh, build a better world. I, I did it, I got through. Congratulations, Denny. <laughs> Thank you very much. I have for no idea what the time is. I'm just in, in this space. <laughs> Sensational. Thank you very much for that, Denny. I, I guess uh, we, we've got some questions that came in before your webinar and uh, afterwards um, as well. So, hey, everybody, I'm Chris from Literacy Quebec, and uh, we've got a few questions uh, from you, the audience, uh, coming for Denny, uh, which I read in uh, some in the question and answer uh, field as well. Um, so, uh, um, if it, if it wasn't already uh, uh, answered throughout your presentation, Denny, what, what is the most current research in family literacy? I think, I think that um, it, depends, it depends on uh, the country, it depends upon the group, and it depends on whether, um, whether corporations have 
uh, an opportunity to co-opt the, the the concept and and so it's not it's it it really the the work that um you're doing in literature quebec is the work that is going on around around the world and i think i you know it sounds pretty um uh, pretentious i think to say the most recent work is that is the work that's going that i've been doing at, at the un i mean the revelation is that family literacy workers are working with families on local problems on local issues that issue could be that they've lost their water supply it could be that that girls are not going to school it could be that young men have come home from uh, some armed conflict it could be covid i think the most it's the, the, so the research is there and um, we it's taking place but it's almost invisible because family just doesn't have um, the cachet that, that gets global leaders you know it, 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 we're not really focused at the global level we're focused on um, ideas like multilateralism and yet it's families across the globe that are doing the multilateral work that global leaders are talking about that they're ignoring so so i think that the work the most important work that's going on is the local work that is spread out across all countries um and um i think the other thing that's important is that uh the fact that it's in 140 countries it is the local work that that is spreading throughout throughout the globe so i don't know if that answers the question mm -hmm. no, you thank can tell you very, me you very much yeah. this is like dissertation my defense of my dissertation <laughs> thanks danny um so given restrictions, how, in your opinion, safe is it to, to run face-to-face -face programs? Um, we have tried to run virtual and although, you know, okay, face-to-face um, -face has been a lot more effective. It, it's, it, it's, the, it's a huge issue in, this, in the, the States, also in Wales and in the UK. Um, because schools are now, now shut down. The, the one thing that's going on in Canada is that you're privileging, if that's, you know, that's the word that, that comes to mind because um, the States is certainly not focused on children or families. And I don't think that's the case in the UK either, as far as COVID is concerned. But Canada is keeping schools open. And so children are getting some face-to-face but the idea of face-to-face um, of -face at this time in family literacy programs is probably, uh, I, I don't know that it's advisable. I'm not a medical uh, doctor. I do think that it's a time where we have to be incredibly creative in finding ways to take the principles of family literacy and to apply them in a virtual way space and i know it's not i i'm actually working with children in in wales and um in uh the states here I, the neither of I, I haven't met them i i only know them virtually and we're and we are corresponding through letters and and other things and sharing stories um it it is the inventiveness of family literacy professionals, I think, as well as families that are going to make it work, which is a tall order. Mm. Yeah. So I, I don't have, I don't have a satisfactory answer to your question, because I'd like to say, oh, get together, but we can't. I don't think. You might be in better shape in Canada than we are here. Mm -hmm. yeah. Absolutely. No, thank you, Denny. Um, we have blended cultures in families and uh, will reading to a child in many languages enhance literacy? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I have this conversation with parents who say, 
um, and and only informally who say um, I, they're, they're talking to their children in in English and they're reading to them in English and they speak three languages. And I'm saying, why aren't you reading in? Why aren't you? And they worry. Uh, and it is such a blessing to live in a family or to have in a culture that has more than one language. It is absolutely um, the best thing for, for children to, to be able to, to uh, grow up speaking multiple languages. And there might be that moment when they're very young, when they seem to, it takes a little longer, but, but it's, it's fine and it's actually, uh, in the best of worlds, we'd all be speaking multiple languages. Okay, great. Um, how has the field of literacy, family literacy, evolved and changed over the years to the current day? The, the, when we uh, began uh, family literacy research, the focus was on observing families and in um, learning from them. So as an ethnographer, I've never been the expert. I'm always the learner and I'm always there to try and find out how other people do things or any people do things. But in spending time with families, uh, I'm not trying to teach them. I'm trying yeah. to learn from them. And so, so um, the, the whole idea of family literacy was based on description that we learn from families, we describe what they do, and we learn from them. Very quickly, early on, um, it was changed to being in, in the States, and I think other countries as well, Western countries, to being prescriptive. And so, so the, the fact that you learn from families was replaced with, you use family literacy as a way to uh, impose on, on families and uh, very often school literacy on families. Um, and in the States, what happened was that uh, the court system got a hold of family literacy and was actually prescribing, or I guess prescribing is not the right word in a court situation, but young mothers um, were being told they had to uh, uh, get, attend family literacy. So it also became punitive. And in the 90s, I, I held a, um, a weekend uh, family literacy conference and we had, we didn't have any money, but I called up friends as far as way as Australia. <laughs> yeah. We had an Australia. <laughs> yeah. so, so four continents and uh, we put up this, this uh, around a chalkboard, some straw and one of my doctoral students did this and she said, this is our field of dreams and as, people said they would come, we put their names up. And we ended up with um, the top people, I suppose, in research, in, in family literacy from around the world. And we put together principles. One of the papers that I sent to you has the main areas of those principles in it. And so uh, Jerry Harsley, I think it was, said to me that it, he had worked harder that weekend than he'd ever worked in his life. Next week, we broke into groups, we worked on the principles and we tried to shift it back to a descriptive way and to stop this. So that, so this, there, there is a rich history. Uh, meantime, in Canada, the work, uh, you, you were trailblazing. We did have people from Canada at that conference. Uh, and the, I, I, have the here the family literacy in Canada profiles of effective practice. It's a great book edited by uh, Adele Thomas in the nineties. Uh, so that's the basis of it, and it's only recently, in the last five or six years, I suppose, that I've been aware of the work around the world, because the UN also took the concept and and worked with it. It's probably too much of an answer. But it, but it really is a rich history, and we have to we have to be really careful when it's formalized. You know, you can't formalize like a grandmother reading with her grandson. You know, or you know, making pancakes. Yeah. You know, 
and measuring and reading something. I mean, that's family literacy. So. Yeah. Um, thanks, Danny. So um, just a, a couple more questions. And uh, I'll try um, to make sure. You're, do you're doing great. Um, how are parents with low literacy skills best accommodated for uh, in family literacy programs? So how are, how are parents with low literacy skills best accommodated for in family literacy programs? Is the, is the program for them or is it for their children? Uh, both, I guess uh, it actually wasn't um, um, in, in the question, but uh, can we start with with both, I, I might I think, have just had a, a, a quick uh, uh, both. I think the, the thing that is really important, uh, and it comes back to this um, supporting families or prescribing to families. If we if we want uh, families um, where they're 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 challenged by literacy uh, to participate in programs, uh, then they need to to be uh, verified and they need to uh, feel comfortable. And um, they, it shouldn't be a situation where um, it becomes skill and drill. There needs to be stories, they need, there can be audio books. There are all kinds of ways to, to bring literacy to the family. Even the idea of um, an audio story that the whole family can share. And that there can be the book that goes with the audio story, uh, those those kinds of things. But the other thing that's really important. So so back up. So the idea of finding for individual families or groups of families ways in which they can feel that they um, are participating and cared for, and and the joy thing is is important that it isn't just a struggle. That's really important. Um, and um, I was going to say something else and I've forgotten it. I, I think that the other thing that, that comes to mind here is that um, children often become their parents or the adult that's caring for them, the culture broker, but also can be, be the literacy aid. Um, but one of the things that I have encountered a few times in over the years is people who um, whose lives have become so dysfunctional, not no, not for anything, not because of anything they've done, but because of circumstances that they've stopped reading. So low literacy skills can often be associated with the circumstances of a person's life. And I worked with uh, in toxic literacies. Um, there's one man in there that worked as a research assistant to me who was homeless. And um, we, it's a long story in, in uh, that book. But times when he was really struggling, he literally could not read. And so, so it's not, it's not a, as simple as um, giving someone a test and saying they've got low literacy skills. It's a matter of what are the life circumstances. Oh, and I've remembered what I was going to say. The, the other thing that's really important is to find out what they're good at. What is it? You know, it might be ice fishing. It might be, it could be anything, anything that has skills. You know, and um, I've all, because there are 75,000 people living on the streets of New York. It takes a lot of knowledge to be able to survive. And so understanding the knowledge base and the survival skills or some special skill that a person has that isn't recognized is a really important thing to do. I don't know if that answers the question. I look very much so, Denny. Thank you. Thank you very, very much for answering those questions. And I think we, we've got every, every... I gave two long answers. My son would say, you can't answer anything under 15 minutes. <laughs> 
No, I think everyone on, online would uh, appreciate you going into, into those details. So thank you very much, um, Denny. Uh, but before you go, uh, I'm just going to uh, get Margot Legal back on okay. and, uh, and, um, and uh, outro you. So thank you for that. I'm going to, I'm going to jump off here. <laughs> okay. Okay. We'll Hi. Um, thank you so much, Denny. We actually have um, one more question and also just a comment. So the last question that we have is, um, could you elaborate on which essential literacy skills are being used through arts and crafts activities, particularly for adults participating? Um, and then the person says, often in the grants that we write regarding family literacy, they're not accepted if, it, if it's not reading a book. Um, and it would be great to hear your thoughts on how art arts-based programming supports low literate adult participants? I can actually send you uh, so, some uh, information. I taught a course on writing pictures, painting stories. And so the arts, so they're absolutely critical. They're critical on all kinds of levels because, and because uh, people need to feel good if they're going to become good readers. You can't become a good reader if you're so stressed out over learning skills. So, um, so it's absolutely, uh, it's vital that we support the arts and that we see the arts as, uh, as one conduit for, for literacy, but also as symbol systems in their, in their own right. This, these are semiotic systems that we need to be, to be supporting. And I know that you're a knitter and um, I knit too, and I read, I read knitting patterns. I can now read knitting patterns in, in Japanese. And so, so but, you know, this is a different, this is not reading and writing as people are thinking of it. But I sympathize with your grant writers because I once put joy into, feeling joyful into a grant and I was told they won't fund it. I said, but we need, we need children to feel joy. And, and the response was, they won't fund it. I said, okay, so I'm not writing the grant. But I could do that, I didn't actually need to. But if you're running programs, you really need the grant. So I'll try and find some stuff and send you. Um, certainly for, I can send you stuff from the course that they could, that could be quoted in, um, in a grant that would be helpful. I don't know if that's helpful or not. But. Oh, for sure, that's helpful. And I think that, um, you know, it, there's always a struggle with the types of programs and projects that you want to run, no matter what the field or sector is, and um, sort of trying to use the language that the donors or the funders um, it is, it is you know, a accept. Very so it, it's a common issue. It's, it's almost like a game, isn't it? You've got to find what you can say. And, and know what you want to do and try and bring those together. So I, I my, you know, my heart goes out to you because I know it's not easy. For sure. Um, and we do have a comment from um, Kim Chung from the Center for Family Literacy. So she's joining us all the way from uh, Edmonton. Uh, she says, hi, Denny. I love how you keep bringing it back to the family unit as the organizing piece and how the context of the whole family is important. It's very reaffirming as the struggle um, to get family literacy recognized as having the power it has. Our programs are completely online now and the feedback from adults on how essential the program has been to stay connected um, to something has been overwhelming. Isn't that wonderful? And I think she, to, I forgot her first name. Pardon? The lady's first name. Uh, Kim. Kim. You know, I think the fact that when you're working and you can say that the family literacy is in 140 countries worldwide and you can use that kind of information to, to bring gravitas to the idea that what you're doing is local, but it has global impact. And, uh, and uh, especially for Canada, that's had so much influence throughout the world. And probably most family literacy specialists in, in Canada don't know that, right? They've been vital. 
Well, Danny, I just want to thank you um, from Literacy Quebec, from the staff, from all the attendees. This has been a wonderful event and um, we're so grateful um, that, you know, we were able to connect with you. And for all those on the call, um, I think, you know, it's sort of eye-opening to see that there's a few um, things that I think personally I take from your presentation is that really teachers, whether, you know, they're caregivers, parents, community workers, event organizers, teachers are the first responders in traumatic situations for children. Um, and the other thing is that I think all of us who are doing work in family literacy, we really need to take a step back and realize that, um, as you said, you know, this work is restoring the social fabric of children's lives. And so that's very powerful, very meaningful, <laughs> very powerful, very meaningful. And, um, you know, you've, you've taught us all a lot <laughs> within this that's one hour. <laughs> I've learned a lot too and I'm so grateful to meet you all and if I can help in any way you just send me an email and I will try to do that. That's great that's fantastic and um, good luck uh, everybody. <laughs> yeah. Stay well.